Greetings, everyone. I want to continue on with the Blood Covenant, and I promised you I would talk about the Robe of Righteousness in Genesis 15. Uh, the Robe, if you notice the story of David and Jonathan, right after David um, slew the giant, Jonathan took off his robe and handed it to David along with his weapons. And this had great significance to covenant. And what the robe represented in those days was their identity. Like Joseph, remember Joseph, um, a, um, one of um, Jacob's sons, Isaac, I mean, I'm sorry, Israel's son. His, his name was Jacob, but it got ch changed to Israel. Um, and he was partial to Joseph, and he made him a coat of many colors. And um, the coat, people would know a person, they could see them in a the distance and see their coat and know who it was. So if all of a sudden somebody else is wearing that coat, that means they've entered into a covenant with someone, and they're saying, all that I am, I'm giving to you. Everything I have. Both partners make this pledge. And uh, like, let's say the richest man on earth, who I don't even want to say anybody's name because somebody else will say, well, that's not the richest man. Let's, let's just say a rich man enters into a covenant with my husband. And my husband maybe forgot to pay our house insurance and lightning struck our house and burnt it to the ground. All he'd have to do is go over to his richest, his rich man's covenant partner and just say, where's the checkbook? Um, that's how they viewed it. And it's like the marriage. Um, when we get married, we share accounts. Whatever's in that account is mine and my husband's. Um, we share bills. We share assets. And that's how a friendship, a covenant friendship was viewed. And there was also the exchange of the weapons. And that meant that your enemies are now my enemies. And what they did in those days was they would, um, usually the wrist or their arm, somewhere on them, they would cut and, sh and have blood. And sometimes they would, um, they would both cut their hands and grasp each other's hands in a shake, blending their blood together. See that we talked a little bit about them becoming one blood and this is part of the ritual we know even though it doesn't record it in scriptures we know it happened because the very word covenant comes from the root root word to cut and since covenant um was uh, something well known to the people in the bible they didn't have to write down what everything meant because they knew so um they would have this scar and they would rub you know like gunpowder or dirt into it to make it scar more. So if somebody was coming into your neighborhood, you would ra raise up your hand and you'd show them that scar so that person would know there's more to you than you. That, that scar meant they were in covenant with someone. You just never knew how big their covenant partner was. So it was, you know, and we, we swear an oath in court. We put one hand on the Bible, we swear an oath. Some of these came down through covenant even though we lost the meaning of covenant. Um, and there's a beautiful story of the Gibeonites in this, I believe in Joshua 9 and 10 or somewhere, it may start in 8. I'm um, not good at remember references, but if you go read Joshua, you'll see the story of the Gibeonites. They were people that lived in the land that God had promised to the Israelites. Remember, God made a promise before to Abraham, and now the Israelites, 400 years left Egypt, they are coming in to, um, to possess the land that was already promised to them. And God told them before they crossed over the Jordan not to make covenant with the people of the land because God wanted to give them the land. Well, the Gibeonites had heard about how protective the God of Israel was. So what they did is they, they um, pretended to be from a far country. They put on old ragged clothes and worn out shoes and patched up bags and they come limping into to camp like they were weary travelers and they wanted to make covenant with the children of Israel and the children of Israel did and then they found out later they lived right 
not too far from them. So um, what happened was, man, they pulled it off. They tricked them into covenant. And even though they lied and deceived the Israelites, that covenant still stood. It still it, it was not breakable because they had shed blood and, you know, they entered into this blood covenant. And um, now they went home. They were happy because now they're one of the Israelites or one with them. Well, there were some kings around them, some tribes around them that decided to make war with them because they made covenant with Israel. So they sent a message to Joshua. Hey, we're under attack. Joshua and his army did not hesitate to go and fight these enemies of the Gibeonites. And what's amazing, because the Israelites are in oneness with God, now the Gibeonites, I'm sorry, Israelites are one with God through the covenant of Abraham. And here's the Gibeonites being part of that oneness. So even though the covenant was with the Israelites, because the Israelites were one with God, that meant they were one with God too. So not only did Joshua and his army fight against their enemies, God did. Hellstones were rained down on their enemies to protect them. So God honored this covenant, <laughs> even though it was made under deception. Now that should tell you how strong the blood covenant is. So just think about that. Jesus shed his own blood to bring us into covenant with him. He's not going to break it. So if you've been a person that maybe got fell into temptation and you got into bondage again, God is there. He still loves you. And he's not going to let you go. And I know for me, understanding that, it literally set me free from so many temptations I had been battling in my mind. And I was all of a sudden I was free. There was no more struggle. I realized I was one with my father and he was not letting me go. And that verse, perfect love cast out all fear. And that just became a reality. There was no more fear of losing my salvation. When I understood that covenant is permanent and God's not going to let go. He even Scripture even says he's faithful when we're not. Um, I'm not sure why my phone keeps shaking. Probably because I'm moving around. Uh, and then as I began to understand this covenant, that robe. See, we... We take on the identity of Jesus. And when I was going through the struggle of, of de reprogramming my mind, see, I got my I, I got the revelation of the righteousness, but the old programming I had been in was still there. So I had to renew my mind to truth. So here I am, I'm struggling in an illness, and I'm in a lot of pain and I'm fatigued. So I'm not able to keep my house as clean as I would like it. I'm not able to do everything with the family that I'd like just because I had to rest a lot. That was the only thing that kept my pain levels down. So I get bombarded with all these accusations about what a failure I am. Look at you. You know, this kind of stuff. I would get out of bed in the morning and I would pretend like I was putting on a robe. And I would say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. That's my new identity now. I'm walking in that. And I just did that every morning. And there were times when the accusations would come through my mind or other people. Sometimes that happens. And I would go off somewhere and I'd just scream, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. And I started reprogramming my thinking to my identity in Jesus. Scripture says, as he is, so are we. Jesus he is our, our identity. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live now, I live by faith in him. Because he loved me and he gave his life for me. Are you starting to see how much our Father loves us? When I was seeking God, I wanted a revelation of the gospel. And there were certain verses the Lord kept taking me to. One uh, verses were in Rome, Romans. There's none that are good. There's none that do good. There's none that seek God. 
So I knew God sought me. I knew there wasn't me, any goodness in me that sought God. I knew that. And he kept taking me to that verse, come, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I'm meek and humble, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He took me to that verse every day for weeks. And I didn't, I finally broke down. I just said, Lord, I don't even know what that rest is. I didn't understand it. it. I was so blind by the legalism I had been indoctrinated in that I did not know what the rest of God was. And there's other verses about the rest of God that God would take me to, but that one was the main one. So I said, Lord, I, I need to understand what that rest is. And so many believers out there they do not know what the rest is because they are like me. They've been indoctrinated with the works, you know, and their whole life, like I was, is centered on that local church building and their organization and their doctrines. And, and, uh, and they got to They got to keep the doors open. They need you to, um, keep the doors open. So they're, they're a lot of works based sermons over the years. And um, so what happened was I was reading that book, The Power of the Blood Covenant by Malcolm Smith. I highly recommend that book. If you buy no other book outside the Bible, that's the one I recommend. And I was learning about the unconditional love of God. I was learning about the different aspects of covenant. And then he starts bringing us to Genesis 15. And this is where God comes to Abram. Now remember... I had said he kept taking me to the verse, there's none that do good, there's none that seek God. So here's God seeking out man. And it's so plain to me, and in a dream, God came to Abram and said to him, I am your shield and your great reward. This is covenant language. Shield, I'm your protector, your great reward. Everything I am is yours. So. God is promising him this, you know, and, and Abram, and I'm putting this in my own words, I've read this story so many times, you know, in his own words, well, what good is that going to do? I have no son. At that time, him and Sarah were childless, and um, God took him outside and he pointed to the stars in the heaven. He said, count those as you can. That's how your descendants are going to be. So, then God made some other promises and, and about the land. And he told him, you know, his, you know, his, his future children were going to be enslaved for 400 years. And then God would give them the land. And, and Abram believed God. And it was counted to him as righteousness. Um, actually, let me get this straight. Once God pointed to the stars... And said, that's how your descendants are going to be. Abram said, Abram, it said Abram believed, Abram believed, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Please forgive me. It's been a while since I've read the story. So, us all Abram did. He believed, and it was counted as righteousness. Remember, righteousness has to do with our covenant relationship. But then God made the other promises. And, and Abram wanted to know, how will I know this is true? So God told Abram to go get these animals. And if you read the story, you see Abram doesn't ask God what to do with the animals. He knows what to do because he's entering into a covenant. This was um, one of the tribes. This was a, a common ritual that took place in the covenant. And it's called the walk of blood where they'd split these animals in half and put them out like this, and there would be a pool of blood that would um, pull down in a trench-like thing, and the the covenant heads, remember we talked about that before, would walk through the blood, and even their hands and their feet would get the blood, and they, were, they would walk in a figure eight, and that symbolized that it couldn't be broken. And both covenant partners were supposed to walk through this blood in a figure eight. And, um, oh, sorry about that. Let me try this. Okay. 
So both would walk through the blood, <clears throat> and they would they would announce blessings or curses, the blessings if you kept covenant, the curses if you didn't, and they would swear an oath and ask for their God to help them keep the covenant. So if you read the story, you see Abram did not walk through the blood. At the point he should have been walking through the blood, God puts him to sleep. Remember, God is invisible. You cannot see him with the naked eye. So God manifests as a smoking oven and a burning torch. And all of a sudden, when I was reading this in this book, my eyes were open to the gospel. My eyes were opened to the, the rest of God. I saw it. I saw it in Abram sleeping while God made the oath. God made the promises. God is going to keep covenant with man. Abram could not offer anything to God in this great exchange because everything he had, including the breath he believed, he breathed, came from God. So the smoking oven, if you think it, it's fire. You can't touch it. But here's a stick, a torch with fire on the end of it. It's something that can be touched and felt as something that can be passed on to someone else. Think of this, God became man in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This was Jesus, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is Jesus. This is Abram's future descendant making the oath on his part. And he's God, and he's man, this is before he literally became flesh. But this is an oath God is making with Abraham. Abraham. He becomes Abraham after the covenant. We'll explain that maybe another time. But so here is God manifesting of the smoking oven and this burning torch. He's making an he's making an oath. He's not going to break this oath. This covenant oath with Abraham. And it is like God took me and showed me. Jesus walking up the hill in his very own blood. He was walking. He was doing the walk of death on my behalf. He was making a covenant on my behalf. The covenant that was promised in the Old Old Testament. You go back and read the scriptures. On the, just look for new covenant. Start reading all the promises. And what, I'll just give you a quick rundown is that he said that this new covenant, he was going to take our heart of stone out and give us a heart of flesh. He was going to write his laws on our heart. He, we would be his, and he would be ours. And he said, you won't have to go to your neighbor anymore and say, know the Lord, for all will know him, from the least of them to the greatest. He also said, your sins... And transgressions, I'm not going to remember anymore. This is the oath he promised when he walked in his own blood to that cross. He and, and then remember, Jesus said, this is the blood the night before his crucifixion. He was saying, this is the blood of the new covenant. And what happens in so many churches is they try to keep the old covenant and the new. But this is God's law. He says, if you love your neighbor, you fulfill the law. The heart of the law is God's love. And um, so, and so there was the peace of God, right? I mean, the rest of God right there. God opened my eyes to it. And I've talked about this in previous videos that Jesus said it is finished. No more. We can't add any more to it. It's his perfect creation. See, one man, Adam, his sin, his one sin put all of humanity in sin. But here is Jesus who is God in the flesh representing us and he is bringing us into new life no more sin now we're into righteousness and living and loving our father he brings us into this new relation this new creation he's and it's phenomenal and I wept when I saw it my eyes were opened all the years I spent trying to make myself righteous 
trying to be good and never ever fully succeeding in that. And um, here's God opening my eyes. There's nothing I could do to add to his finished work on the cross because he represented all of us on that cross and he became that sin. Remember that 2 Corinthians 5, 21? He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. There's that robe of righteousness that he's given to us. He became that sin and nailed it to the cross once and for all. And I just pray right now in the name of Jesus, those of you that are stuck in that legalistic mindset like I was, that your eyes will be open. Because see, whenever the law is taught, Scripture says there's a veil that comes over the heart and you can't see the grace because you're trying, your focus is on trying to keep the law, but Scripture says fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He is the author and he is the finisher of our faith. And scripture says, if you walk in the spirit, you're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. So there's so much to this new covenant. And church has made it all about focusing on not sinning and behavior. And it's like a treadmill. Or it's a lot like a dog who chases his tail and can never catch it. You know, it's like when Jesus said, he said this to the Pharisees, be perfect as my heavenly father is perfect. That's like trying to jump up and reach the moon. It's impossible. So God in Christ, he has made us perfect forever. It, he, we're complete in him. And remember, Paul is over in Romans. He's talking about, you know, he desired not to sin, but yet he still did. And, and he's, he made this audacious comment that if he's sinning and, and he doesn't want to, it's no longer him doing it. It's the sin in his flesh. And he said, but who can set me free from this? He said, Jesus, he's the one that sets us free. When you reach the end of your trying, when you know you've tried your hardest and you just couldn't do it, is when you realize Jesus is the only one who sets us free. He's the only one. Him who the Son sets free is free indeed. And our salvation is total gift. And um, it's the gospel. See, Paul. Uh, I think it was Paul that said, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So what is the gospel? Is it what, is it what man has to do to try to appease a, an angry God? Or is it what a loving father did to bring his children back into his bosom? Well, I believe it's our father's passionate love for us, the value that he placed on us, that this is the reason Jesus went to the cross, despising the shame, but doing it for us because he loves us. And he wants us to know that. He wants us to live in that. And there's more I could say. I've given you a lot, but like I say, I recommend do some more studying on the covenant and be willing to lay down the doctrines of your church and um, let the Holy Spirit teach you about Jesus and who he is. And I just pray for your eyes to be open, that you would know his, the depths of his love, and that you can learn to live in that and, and know that you are loved and you are accepted. See, Jesus will never cast anyone away from him who comes to him. That is love. Because that's who God is. God is love. Take care now. I'm done talking and uh, I have a, maybe one or two more teachings to do on the covenant and then I'll be done. I don't see myself as a teacher, honestly. I'm just sharing you what God opened my eyes to. And I'm going to tell you, I was the Pharisee of Pharisees. So if God can open my eyes, he can open your eyes too. Take care and God bless.